Keith, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to look at um, the whole of Genesis 24, so do keep, uh, keep those pages open in the Bible, page 23 and uh, 4 and 5. Let me pray uh, for all of God's help as we look at it together. Lord God, please show us the wondrous mystery of the way you work in the world and how you have fulfilled everything you've spoken in your Son, Jesus Christ. Please speak to us, and would you give us ears and hearts to receive all that you say. In Jesus' name, amen. At this point of the service, I don't know if you ever feel that... um, Sometimes there's a bit of a a difference between your time at church and your time in the week. Um, You've just come from all sorts of very mundane, normal things, and uh, now you're here and you're meant to be hearing about God and his wonderful ways of working in the world, and there's something of a sort of disconnect. It doesn't seem to sort of tally with Thursday afternoon or whatever you've got on coming up. Um, Genesis 24 is a wonderful chapter for removing that disconnect. And it's going to show us how the way God works in the world for his amazing purposes intersects with the lives of ordinary people like you and me in their very mundane and normal lives. Um, What I love about Genesis is the way we get so much detail about people and their lives. I think I said it a couple of weeks ago. And this chapter is an even more great example of slowing down to see people and their lives and all that is happening. There are a number of characters here. Abraham we get a bit of. We get a lot of Abraham's servant. He's the sort of the main player throughout. We're going to get a bit of Rebecca, Rebecca's brother Laban, and at the end, Isaac, all sorts of characters. What I want us to do this morning is learn from three of them about their experience in everyday life and what they learn about God. We're going to look at Abraham It's the end of his uh, sort of life, as it were. We'll focus on him a bit. We're going to look at Abraham's servant, and we're going to look at Isaac and see how they each learn what kind of God it is they're worshipping. Abraham's been the main player for a few chapters now. You remember God's made these extraordinary promises to him. He's the man of promise. He's the man of faith because he trusts those promises. And we're, we're working, as God has given it, with three promises, promises of a great people, the promise of a great land in which he would live with his descendants, and then it promised to be a great blessing to the world through all of those descendants. And to start with Abraham here, he's learning of God's absolute certainty in keeping his promises. Abraham has had a bit of an up and down life, and just at this moment, it doesn't really seem as if God is going to keep his promises. Abraham's family is shrinking It's not growing at this point. The promise of many descendants looks decidedly dicey once again because his wife Sarah has just died, chapter 23 if you were here. It's now just him and Isaac. Now for the promise of a great people to continue, Isaac needs to have children. Uh, For Isaac to have children, first biology lesson, Isaac also needs to get married. Now, there are different ways Abraham could work that out. He could do a number of things to make that happen. He could try and find a nice Canaanite girl for Isaac. That that would be the sort of easiest thing to do. There's plenty of them around. The problem with that is that um, to marry outside the people of God is not going to be good long term. In which case, maybe he should go back to his homeland where his relatives and his family are living. Maybe he should find Isaac a wife from there. Well, the problem with that is he doesn't want to leave the promised land because that's where God's told him to be. So Abraham tells a servant, his chief servant, to go back to the relatives and find a wife for Isaac. Just have a look at verse 3. That's where he tells the servant what to do. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. That would be a bad move among whom I'm living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for Isaac. Uh, 
Now, I don't know if, you, uh, if you'd thought of being Abraham's servant, what you'd feel about having to do that kind of job. I suppose the problem is, what if the potential girl isn't particularly keen? Uh, come to a place you've never been to marry a fella that you've never met. Uh, he suggests, well, why don't I take Isaac with me? And Abraham says, no, don't do that. Verse 6, make sure you do not take my son back there. And Abraham's not being awkward at that point. Abraham is proving that he's a man who trusts God's promises. The promises said that Abraham's going to have loads and loads of descendants, and he needs to stick and trust that God will deliver. It would have been a whole lot simpler just to go and find a Canaanite wife or just to send Isaac back to the relatives back in their homeland. But what would that have meant Abraham had done? That would have meant Abraham would stop trusting God's promises and stop obeying what God had asked him to do. That so easily happens, doesn't it, in the subject of marriage and choosing a spouse. Uh, This chapter, by the way, is not an example of how to find a marriage partner. Um, But there's something about this chapter which reminds Christians, I think, who perhaps looking for a marriage partner um, over, over the years of your life. God doesn't promise us the same things as he promises Abraham and Isaac. He doesn't promise us individuals many, many descendants. His promise to a Christian, well, there are many promises, but one of them would be that in Christ we lack nothing that we need. In Christ, we have every spiritual blessing that we could possibly need. That's the promise for Christian people. So for those here this morning, perhaps, who are single, I trust you know that you are not lesser in God's sight, that you're not inferior in every, any way, that whatever the world may tell us or however other believers may pressurize us rather unwisely, In Christ, we have all that we need. That's the promise to trust, isn't it, for a single person? And then don't forget equally God's commands. If you're a single person, he says we're to marry someone who's also a Christian. That's the command to obey. So when someone comes along and it seems like you get on like a house on fire and surely this is the person who's going to make your life what you always hoped it would be, you need to keep trusting the promises of God and keep obeying the commands of God. And not, as Abraham did, not try and take a shortcut. I'll just get married because that surely will fulfill me. Or I'll just marry this person even though they're not a Christian because surely that'll do the job. No, we're to trust God's promises and to obey God's commands. Now, by the end of the chapter, God has delivered wonderfully because Isaac uh, has a wife. The many descendants promise is still on. It's still alive. In fact, the promise will, of course, continue. It'll continue from Isaac to Jacob, uh, from Jacob to Joseph at the end of the book of Genesis, from Joseph even on to Moses, and you follow it all the way down, it lands in Jesus Christ. Uh, In the New Testament, the apostle Paul explains to uh, the Christians in Galatia how the promises that were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, they're fulfilled in Jesus. The scripture says, uh, or rather does not say, says Paul, and to seeds, meaning many people, but to seed, the seed, meaning one person. It's all fulfilled in the one person, Christ. If you're a Christian, I don't know how you think of God's faithfulness and how you see God's faithfulness in the world, but actually the the biggest sign, mark, indication of God's faithfulness, it's that Jesus Christ has come. Jesus' arrival into the world is a sign of God's faithfulness. You carry the promise on, the other sign of God's faithfulness today is that people still become Christians. When you turn to the Lord Jesus for the first time, That's God being faithful to a promise to make a whole mass of people who'll be his people from every nation and tribe. The promise of descendants, it continues through Christ. So descendants of Abraham today, those who share the faith of Abraham, who trust in the Lord Jesus. And by the end of time, those people will be more numerous than the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. 
the certainty of God's promise. That's what Abraham knows and clings on to. How, though, in this chapter does God actually keep that promise? He does it by the beauty of his providence. Don't worry about the big word for the moment. Um, That's what Abraham's servant saw. Uh, We haven't mentioned um, rugby this morning yet. Um, For England fans, it's slightly elephant in the room. Uh, Do pray for Joel and me uh, that we'd uh, keep... uh... Um, If you didn't know, we're in the middle of the Rugby World Cup and um, there's been some uh, big games. The Rugby World Cup is a competition at the moment slightly with a sort of two-tier system of teams. There's some teams who are particularly strong at rugby, others who aren't so known for being strong at rugby. And uh, what's fun is when the the lesser-known countries at playing rugby win against the well-known rugby nations. And just over a week ago, Japan, you may have heard, beat South Africa, which is a huge upset, but a sort of lower tier, so we think, overturning a, a, a stronger rugby nation. The unknown uh, is, is triumphing. Um, chapter 24 is the triumph of the unknown character. Abraham's servant is one of those lesser, lesser people, lesser characters. And he is an absolute model of living by faith and loyalty to his master. He's a complete hero. Let's just see what happens. Uh, turn over the page if you've got a church Bible, page 24 we're going to be on. He arrives in the city of Nahor and he devises a plan to try and find Isaac a wife. Verse 14 is uh, sort of the heart of the plan. He's praying to God. He says, may it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink and I'll water your camels too, let her be the one who you've chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I'll know that you've shown kindness to my master. So he's looking for two things in this test. He's looking for a girl who's going to offer him a drink and offer to water the camels as well. That's quite a good criteria for a wife, isn't it? Not to water camels, but to serve and to be helpful and servant-hearted, hospitable. That's the test that he's going to try. Now, before he's finished praying, Rebecca comes out, verse 15. She's got her jar on her shoulder, and we as readers know who she is. She's the the one who's been mentioned in Nahor's round robin that we had in chapter 23. Nahor is Abraham's brother, and he was writing to the family to say that his family's blossoming, thank you, and he now has a granddaughter called Rebecca. And she's the one here who's about to bump into Abraham's servant. You think, what are the chances of that? By the way, she's beautiful. That's not actually on Abraham's servant checklist, but it's a nice bonus. And no one's ever lain with her, so she's eligible for marriage. That's good. And so the servant jumps into action. He's got to apply the plan. Remember what he's looking for? He's looking for someone who's going to say to him, well, I'll water you and I'll give water for your camels as well. Verse 17, he hurries to meet her and he says a bit tentatively, please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord. And she quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. That's very, very promising, but we're slightly kept in suspense because is she going to say anything else? Verse 19, after she'd given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they finish drinking. Bullseye. There it is. She'll do the camels. They can have as much as they like. I don't know if you know much about camels. Uh, Maybe you've ridden on one or perhaps patted the head of a camel or something like that. Apparently, a camel can drink about 25 gallons of water. And someone has worked out that if the average water jar at the time could hold three gallons, and since there are 10 camels in this party, Rebecca could be running to and from the trough and the well about 80 times. What a kind person. What a willing, hard-working servant. And she's the one who just happens to be there at the time. Except, of course, there's no just happens about it. This is God's deliberate arrangement of all things that happen in the world. This is his hands-on governing of every single detail that occurs. The word is 
his providence. Someone has said, it's as if God is behind the curtain pushing Rebecca on stage right on cue. The beauty of God's providence. Now it seems that the servant still wants to make sure. He's not quite sort of certain. When the camels are done, he gives her some jewellery, nice sort of thank you present, and asks about the family. Verse 24, she answers, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son that Milcah bought a Nahor. Not a whiff of a Canaanite about her. In fact, she's from Abraham's wider family. Of all the places to come to and of all the people to meet, he's found Rebecca. And that's just brilliant of God. He's arranged it all. God is the best kind of genius and arranges the most incidental things to fulfill his good purposes. And the reaction of the servant is exactly right in verse 26. He bows down and he worships the Lord. He says, praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who's not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. He knows exactly why this has all happened. The Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. God is in active control moving the people, answering the prayers, fulfilling his promises all to his glory. That is the beauty of his providence. Now, um, that's actually only half the job done because the servant of Abraham now has to persuade the family that it would be a good idea to take their daughter away and go and marry someone that she's not met. And we're introduced in the bit we didn't read, verse 29, to Rebecca's brother Laban. Now, already we're caused to be a little bit suspicious of Laban because he rushes out as if to be hospitable, but it seems that's only because he's caught sight of Rebecca's nice new jewellery. And rather strangely, the servant then rehearses everything that has happened. And we think that's a bit laborious. I'm so glad we didn't have the second half of the chapter read. That's what we think. But it's to show that it has all come about because of God's perfect organizing of every single detail to bring about his purposes. So the servant relays the story. He said, I was sent because of the promise of God. I prayed fervently about it all to our Lord God. And before I finish praying, Rebecca's the one who came out. And he ends up saying to Laban, well, it's pretty clear, isn't it, that God has led me to Rebecca. What do you reckon? And Laban has to think about it. Verse 50, Laban and Bethuel, they answer, this is from the Lord. I mean, who can say fairer than that? We, we, can't, we can't question it. God is clearly in this. And the response is to praise God. We've seen that. How wonderful that he should be so hands-on with every single detail of the world. Now, as I say in providence and describe it like that, it does, of course, raise a question Uh, If God governs all things in every detail, what are we to say about, well, for example, some of the things we've been praying about this morning? Uh, What are we to say when Christians in Afghanistan have such a terrible time? In a week when 700 plus people have died in the city of Mecca, when you think of the sin in your own life in this last few days. Well, the Bible unashamedly holds two things together. It holds both God's divine control, his sovereign providential hand, and human responsibility. The Bible holds them together so that at one and the same time, we sin or there is a, a disaster in the world on the one hand, and on the other hand, God is nonetheless overruling everything, and he's in complete charge of the world. Now, in one sense, that doesn't really compute with our minds. We find the depths of understanding that just beyond us. But it may help just to think of the best example of where you see that happen. The best example is the death of Jesus. You think of the question, why did Jesus die? Jesus died for two reasons. One reason, because wicked men put him to death and nailed him on a cross. That's one reason Jesus died. Why did Jesus die? Second reason, because... God's set purpose from the beginning of everything was that his son should be handed over to be crucified. Two reasons. 
and they're describing one event. That is the beauty of God's providence. Humans mean what they do for evil in a particular situation. God, in his providence, uses their actions for good. Now, the particular wonder in this chapter, as we just get to the last point, is that God's providence is one of the ways he's keeping his promise for many people to be grown out of Abraham's family, for there to be many descendants, all nations being blessed. If you just think of um, why it is you are a Christian, and if you think of all the circumstances that led to you being a Christian, if you're a Christian, I think of a, a man called John who if you asked him, he would say he's very grateful for a particular party that he went to because he's now a Christian. He was invited to this party um, shortly after his wife died. He was very lonely. And at the party, he met a man, and that man's wife went to a church, and she told John that he should go to the church because they had a midweek club that he might be interested in. John went. John met Yvonne. Yvonne brought John to a Christianity Explored course. John looks back. He said, thank you, God, for that party. That was God's providence. We'll have our own versions, won't we? I thank God for a very elderly doctor whom I hardly know that I am a Christian today. The beauty of God's providential arranging of everything for the good of his purposes, and we're to recognize it, we're to praise God for it. We have those phrases in conversation, don't we? Well, I just so happen to be talking. No, just so happened about it at all. Praise God for his providence. And it doesn't mean we don't pray. Sometimes we think, well, if God's working like that, there's no point us praying. Abraham's servant was praying all the time about the whole process. God graciously uses prayers to bring about his plans. We ask God and we obey God and we trust God whatever happens. Let's look finally just at the end of the chapter of what Isaac knew about God. And right at the end, you see how he knew the comfort of God's provision. Um, the servant and Rebekah, they've gone on the long journey. They eventually get back home to Abraham's place. But now notice Abraham isn't even mentioned. It's a bit strange. It's all about Isaac. Abraham's servant even now calls Isaac his master. This is a, a transition chapter. We're moving in the whole story from Abraham and Sarah to Isaac and Rebekah. They're going to inherit and carry on the promise. And it may be that at the end of the chapter here, we're seeing Isaac in a bit of a bad way. Do you see verse 62? He's come from Beer Lahai Roy. That's the place where Hagar was feeling desperately sorry for herself. It means the living one who sees me. And God does indeed see Isaac and care for him. And we'll see that just in a moment. This chapter ending is a wonderful one. It would make a great sort of film. Um, imagine it's a beautiful evening. Um, the sun is setting. Isaac is out for a walk. And it's an evening he's going to remember for the rest of his life. It's something like love at first sight, or at least raise eyebrows at first sight. It says at the end of verse 63, do you have a look? He went out to the field one evening to meditate, verse 63. And as he looked up, literally raised his eyes, he saw the camels approaching. And then Rebecca does exactly the same thing. Rebecca also looked up, raised her eyes. Ah. The two groups finally meet. And the servant, he's such a good servant, he's, he's really dutiful. He, he unpacks the whole story and tells Isaac, here's, here's the full report, sir, of the trip. And you sort of imagine Isaac being not terribly interested. Oh, please don't worry about that. I've just met Rebecca. You can take the rest of the evening off. Because he then, verse 67, he brings her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebecca. So she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Last week, chapter 23, we were very concerned for Abraham at Sarah's death. We didn't think much about Isaac, but there's a young man, he's lost his mum. God's people certainly grieve differently, but they do grieve and Rebecca, it says, is a great personal comfort. Here is a wife for him to love. But Rebecca, as this chapter finishes, Rebecca is also a great comfort for all of God's people. She is God's provision for the promise. She is how 
descendants will come. There is hope again because God has provided so the promise can carry on. I don't know if you remember when Jesus provides the Holy Spirit for his disciples, what it is that he's talking about with them. At the end of Luke's gospel, he's telling them that they're going to be witnesses to the world. They're going to carry on the plan to make a great people. And he says, I'll send you what my father's promised, so you have power to do that. At the end of Matthew's gospel, he says, as you know, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and fulfill the promise to Abraham that there's blessing for all nations of the world. They'll know that blessing as they become disciples of Christ. And the disciples stand there. You imagine them thinking, how on earth are we going to do that? Jesus says, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Over the past month or so, I think one of the most common prayer requests that I've heard amongst us in our groups or just as individuals is the prayer for courage to speak of Christ to those who are not Christians. I've asked for it for myself. Isn't one of the reasons we struggle because we forget the comfort of God's provision? Three weeks today, we've got a taste of Sunday and we brew ourselves up to try and invite someone. Will you remember the comfort of what God provides for us to speak about Jesus? Let's remember Jesus himself, by his spirit, he is our comfort. The spirit's called, isn't it? Isn't he the, the counselor? In some Bibles, the comforter, not the one who brings tea and a listening ear, but the one who literally gives courage. He's the one who's called alongside so that we might continue to be witnesses for Christ. The strengthener. There was a time when the great preacher George Whitfield went to preach at a fair in West London. And it was evening time. He went with his wife, Elizabeth, and there was a huge mob of very rowdy people. Lots of um, drunken fighting men with bloody noses, boxing and wrestling. And Whitfield stood up on a makeshift pulpit. He began to, to preach. And as he did, many of these sort of rough types, bruises, bloody faces, they stopped what they were doing. They started to walk over him, over to him because they were clearly annoyed that he'd started to preach and they began to shout at him and to taunt him and to threaten him. He's age 27. He begins to wobble, feel a bit fearful. And just then there's a tug on his gown and it's Elizabeth, his wife, who just says to him, George, play the man for God. That's a picture of a comforter, an encourager, strengthener to speak. And don't we need to hear that again and again, the comfort of God's provision. What a blessing to have the spirit of the living God dwell in his people. And the point is that he is given for a purpose that we might make disciples of all nations, that the promise of a great people of all nations, knowing the blessing of Abraham, continues to be fulfilled as we speak of Christ and make disciples of him. Let's pray. Abraham's servant prays, Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who's not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. Lord, we see again your great kindness and your relenting uh, faithfulness to all your promises. We thank you so much for sending Christ as the perfect fulfillment of every promise that you've made. We thank you that you give us all the resources by your spirit to continue serving the promise that there'll be many people praising you at the last day, people from every tribe and tongue and nation. Remind us, we pray, of whom we have in the spirit that you've sent. And would you strengthen us and comfort us and encourage us that we might serve you faithfully. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.